Welcome to Free Speech TV. My name is Carl Nagan. I'm here at the 2018 Bioneers Conference and with me is one of the most distinguished, committed community activists in the Bay Area, Kat Brooks. Very honored to have you with us here today. Honored Thank to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, among your many accomplishments and uh, efforts, you are running for mayor of Oakland. I am indeed. I live in Berkeley and Oakland's a place where I've done work and have lots of friends. What made you decide, given your background with all of the community organization that you've done, to move from the outside to the inside uh, and run for public office? What made you decide to do that? It was a, a, a combination of things. Um, first and foremost is, of course, just I'm deeply disturbed with the direction Oakland is going. Uh, the explosion of our unhoused population, 6,000 people sleeping on the streets every night. The fact that we have a police department and federal receivership now for 15 years, going on 16 years. Um, skyrocketing rents, you know, uh, people being pushed out of the city. The criminalization of blackness and brownness that I'm seeing in Oakland. Um, and then we have a city administration that just disregards and disrespects the voices of our impacted community members. So when you add all that to hundreds of Oaklanders asked me to run, <clears throat> and at first I sort of blew it off. I was like, no, I'm good. But you know, in this particular political moment with all of the crazy things that we have happening at the federal level, the most important thing we can do is fight locally. And I also know from traveling the country and people traveling to Oakland that people look to Oakland as a model for how to resist. And so I thought, you know, if we could truly build a real progressive government in Oakland, as we go, so does the nation. Um, and that's a good way to fight that dude whose name we don't say. <laughs> I may have to say. <laughs> Trump is Dan. One of the one of the nonprofits that you've run is is the Anti Police Terror Project and also the Justice Teams Network. And both of these have to do with the uh, hideous numbers of murders, state sponsored murders violence against people of color. What will you do as mayor to stop this? What, are your, what is your plan and program for this? So first and foremost, we need leadership that's not afraid of the Oakland Police Department or of the Police Officers Union, right? We need a mayor that's gonna demand transparent, transparency and accountability and is gonna have a zero tolerance policy. The mayor can also direct the police to engage differently, i.e., no, you will no longer ask every single black or brown person you pull over whether or not they're on parole or probation. So there's things like that. The second is the Oakland Police Department has been under federal receivership for 15 years, as I said earlier. Um, they have to renegotiate their contract ever so often, right? They can either come into a compliance or we start to figure out what in the contract we can use as a stick, right? We've, there's been a lot of care at what is the stick. The third is we need to change laws at the state and the local level. So people are always asking about police transparency, police accountability. Well, why can't I know this officer's name? Why can't I this? It's because there's a very complicated web of laws that prevent accountability. At the state level, there's this behemoth piece of legislation called the Peace Officers Bill of Rights. Um, and then there's also the Copley decision, which said that no police officer's personnel information can be available to the public. And so I recently, uh, Nancy Skinner authored, and my organization was one of several co-sponsors on legislation, SB 1421, the right to know bill, <clears throat> which now means for, cons for confirmed instances of sexual assault or excessive use of force, communities can do public records requests. That means that we can start to build profiles and patterns of practice um, and hold bad actors uh, accountable. Finally, almost done, finally, we've got to stop ha having law enforcement be the answer to every single social ill we have. Right? If it doesn't require a badge and a gun, we should not send a badge and a gun. I want Oakland to build a model for responding, for instance, to mental health crises that doesn't involve law enforcement. If we would just do that nationally, we would dramatically reduce the number of people that are killed by police every single year. That's extraordinary, but it, it sounds like your focus here is on the structural piece of this, this sort of structural capacity of the state to inflict this kind of harm. Doing that kind of legislative work, changing those rules, administrative procedures, all of that, that's going to involve the governor. It would have to involve the governor, would it not, and the legislature. How are you going to fight that battle as mayor? In partnership with community, the way I fought every other battle I fought, 
as an organizer. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't stop being an organizer because I'm in office. And I'm actually glad you said that because the other thing we need to do is invest in prevention rather than criminalization. And we do that in a bunch of ways. We redirect, you know, so the Oakland Police Department has an incredibly bloated budget as part of the general fund. We need to be redirecting some of those monies to things that actually keep us safe. Workforce training, substance abuse prevention and treatment, mental health, jobs, right, those things, and community models of security. So we have successful models in Oakland right now. There's one in the Laurel District where people are paid a living wage. They are trained in uh, de-escalation, restorative justice, medical, et cetera. They build relationships with the business owners as well as community, and then they become the first line of response, right, as opposed to law enforcement. So this is a community policing, but emphasis on community. Community, so I, I don't like saying community <laughs> policing. Community, community security, security. Okay. community security. Because community yeah. policing used to be our term, right? It used to be the movement's right. term, and then right. it got co-opted. But it's community security. Those models exist. And like I said, if we don't need to send a badge and a gun, we shouldn't send a badge and a gun. We can send community members. So one of the, the, the second problem with this will be the police union itself, I would assume. And so how are you going to get buy-in from I think for some of it it'll be problematic, particularly the transparency and accountability part. Um, I don't actually anticipate having as much trouble with buy-in on a badge and a gun not being the answer to every social ill. Um, I've been doing this work long enough to feel like I've heard enough police officers, not that cops and I sit down together very often, but they don't want to answer mental health calls either. That's not what they're trained to do. They don't want to be called just because your neighbor spilled milk on the front driveway, right? Like this will actually free them up to go do things that they feel are more in line with their mission. And the third thing I'll say is that you've taken an oath to, to protect and serve. That's what you said you wanted to do. And so if that's true, then you shouldn't have any beef with me, right? You too should not want children shot in the back. You too should not want young girls trafficked and raped by other law enforcement. You too should want your oath to mean something. And I know that that's, you know, I, I don't want to make it sound like it's going to be a, a walk in the park. Um, but there are real conversations that need to be had that I don't think have been had. Interesting. In, in all of that 15 years of receivership. In all of the history of the department, right? Let's not forget that the Oakland Police Department recruited Klan's members from the South to come join their ranks. Good. Thank you. Um, homelessness, another huge issue. We're in a state that has the world's sixth largest economy and probably the largest population of homeless people of any state in the United States. New York Times has been writing about this what are you going to try and do to address this very huge problem that affects Berkeley, San Francisco, the whole Bay Area? Well, actually, like to that point, the UN released a report today um, that they, you know, they traveled a bunch of cities in the United States. The two cities they named as the worst in terms of human rights violations, San Francisco and Oakland, California. Right. So our mayor, our current mayor, has been going around saying this is a regional problem. Everybody's dealing with this. Well. No, actually, yeah, there, there are unhoused people everywhere, but the way we are dealing with it is uh, rooted in systemic cruelty. And so the first thing is we have to get people shelter. Anybody who wants shelter deserves shelter. We need to get them shelter. Right now, the mayor is doing that in chemically treated tool sheds 40 people at a time. That's not the answer. At that rate, we'll be, right, it's the year 3000 by the time. Um, so we need to open up city-owned buildings that are sitting empty. We need to partition them, we need to put showers and, and toilets in them, um, and do wraparound social services so that people can sleep in dignity, that women can sleep safely. But your, your ability to get shelter is not dependent on whether or not you agree to the services. Right? So you hear people say all the time, well, they don't want to be in shelters. That's not true. They don't want to be dictated to how they should live their lives. They're still human beings. They're community members. And just like you or I, they want self-determination. And so to me, that's a big piece of the game changer. The second is we've got uh, lots of uh, public land. We need to be using that public land not to sell to the highest bidder for $8,000 a month apartment complexes, but to build low, low income, low income and workforce housing. We're talking about all these high density uh, units that are be going around public transit areas. A, that needs to happen equitably across the city, and B, as these projects come before the Planning Commission, the Planning Commission needs to start at saying 50% of that needs to be for the people who need housing most, right? And jobs. And jobs. The city invests little to none of its dollars in the workforce, of its own dollars, in the workforce development. 
So we need to invest money into workforce development. We need to be attracting businesses that share Oakland values, right? B corporations, folks that are concerned about environment, unionization, diversity, et cetera. And we need to train Oaklanders to take those jobs. And we need workforce development agencies back in the city. A lot of these agencies are on the outskirts of the city and people who are having a hard time finding work don't have the transportation to get there. So those are a few things. Financially, how can you, this, this sounds like a, a, a new deal for Oakland. <laughs> Where are we gonna get the money to do all this? Right. So there's a few things. Um, one is I uh, think that we need to audit all of our departments inside of City Hall. The police department will start there. They clock $30 million on average of unauthorized overtime every single year, right? So that's the first thing. I also do support two new taxes that are on the ballot this year, the real estate transfer tax as well as the vacant lot parcel tax. I'm also a huge supporter of creating a public bank. Right, creating a public bank in the city of Oakland will bring in millions of dollars, save us millions of dollars of fees and fines that we pay to a corporate bank that not only is costing us a lot of money, but it's costing planet Earth um, her vitality and health. They're taking a percentage, I presume, of that. Oh yeah, every fee, fine, you know, the interest, I mean, all of those things, so. Good. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about your other career as an artist and as a poet and as a playwright. And in particular, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the one person, one woman show you did about Natasha McKenna. Yeah. Natasha, could you tell, why did you pick her and what, tell us that story because I don't think a lot of people outside of the Bay Area, even within the Bay Area, know right. it. So Natasha McKenna was tased to death in a Fairfax County jail in Virginia in 2015. And she was tased to death the same month that Yvette Henderson was gunned down in broad daylight with an AR-15 on the West Oakland Emeryville border. And all of that happened within the context of the Say Her Name movement really sort of starting to bubble up. And at first I thought that I wanted to, I should say more, she was living with schizophrenia. Something happened, she called the police for help and as often happens with our people, particularly our people that also have mental health issues, she ended up going to jail, um, which of course exacerbated her, her episode. She was a little bitty thing. They came in hazmat suits. Um, she thought they were trying to kill her and they tased her to death. Um, and so I was up and at first I was thinking about doing a series of vignettes of women that had been murdered by police and I was trying to sleep and she just started to talk to me and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And she was talking so loud that I had to get up and I just started to write. And I, it just became clear that it was her story that I needed to tell. You were channeling her voice. That's what it felt like. I humbly say, yeah, I think so. And so um, it started off as a monologue that I did at Eastside Arts Alliance and evolved into this one woman show where I played Tasha, her mother, uh, one of the cops that killed her, the sheriff, an activist, and a nurse and it's 45 minutes and we do the play with vignette with pieces of her actual murder on the screen behind us extraordinary is there is this on youtube or anything have you put yeah it? yeah there's there's so, some there's some snippets on youtube how would i find it if i were um, to see this cat brooks tasha okay yeah you'll be able to find it there and then there will be a full production of it at z below with three girls theater company next year in san francisco that's great thank you so much cat brooks for all your amazing heroic and beautiful work thank you and as an activist and as an artist and friend to all of us thank you for being with us my pleasure